Thank you guys, you can grab a seat. Thank you, Dan, for getting the, the pulpit. Cheers. You know what, I've never done a sermon after a baptism before and I'm not enjoying it so far. I, can't, I don't think I can follow that. That story is awesome um, from Dan. Hey, listen, my name is Brayton. Um, I've been coming to this church for a couple of years now. I'm going to be giving you the sermon for tonight. My hope is that you get something out of it, at least one thing. Um, I've put a lot of hours into this particular sermon because I feel like that's w- what you deserve. You've made a choice tonight to come here and you're giving up your time, you're giving up some kind of money because you've used to travel here and travel home. So out of respect for that decision, I hope that this sort of pays you back for that, you know? I'm hoping that's what happens at least. <laughs> we're continuing our series called Mind Game. Um, And we're looking at this idea that as Christians, we're renewing our mind or we're actually changing our mind somehow, and that's going to help us serve God better. A bit about me, I went to school just down the road here at Mueller College. Again, been coming to this church for about seven years, did a lot in the youth group here. Um, I've been a worship leader, you might have seen me around. But the other thing I love to do in my free time, and I probably mention it every time I give a sermon, is this, I love to surf. There's something I love to do. But there was a battle in my mind when I started surfing, right? I've been surfing for about eight years now, and I'm still pretty bad at it. I'll be honest, right? For three years running now, I've had this New Year's resolution, and that's to get barreled, to get in the barrel of a wave. And I'm at a three-year streak for having that be my goal, and I haven't reached it yet. So I'm hoping to get through there. But I'm not that good because I think the first three years I was surfing... I, there was this battle in my head and I couldn't get past the point, like in the depth of the water, about how, like I, I couldn't get past the depth for where I couldn't touch. I was trapped in the shallows, right? And I was missing out on the best waves. And I figured I need to get over this battle in my head and paddle out past the shallows into deeper water. And that's where the real surf is. I took friends with me and taught them how to surf. I say taught because I really just said, here's one of my old surfboards, go for it. And I told them the same thing. I said, you see the waves, you see the beach here, you see where the white water's starting? That's where you want to get to. That's the perfect spot. And most of my friends were like me. They had this battle in their head. They couldn't go out that far, except for two of my friends. And both of them were South African. They are fearless people, man. I said, go out to that spot and wait for me. And they went to that spot, and then they went another 50 metres past it out into the ocean. And I had to tell them, slow down, man. That's not as far as you need to go. For them, they didn't have this battle in their mind. In particular, I'm asking this question of our series tonight. How to defeat negative thoughts. Not defend against them. Not hold them at babe, but actually defeat them, end them, because I believe we can. This is a battle that everybody deals with. Everybody deals with this. If you're like most people, there is a gap between who you are and who you want to be. For me, there's a lot of little things I think I should be doing every day, like going to the gym, eating healthy, um, just spending more time with my friends, reading, all these small things I think I should be doing. And then there's these bigger things that I think I should be achieving. Like I should be progressing in my career. I should be buying a new car. I should be getting a home loan. But these things don't seem to happen. And if you're like me, you actually get quite down. And these thoughts seem to come in your head that are quite negative. And then again, if you're like me, you try to distract yourself and get away from those thoughts. You jump on social media and you start scrolling. But social media never really consoles me. It always kind of kicks me when I'm down. I don't know if you're the same. Because I feel bad that I haven't achieved my goals. And then someone like this pops up on my feed. You know the ones. The gym bro. This girl who's eating a protein bar all the time. And they tell me, right, that it's my fault that I haven't gotten to where I want to. That I haven't worked hard enough to get somewhere. That's what I think the world tells us sometimes, right? That we're not living the life we want because you have done nothing to earn it. That's one of these negative thoughts I'm talking about. 
a quick pause here. The negative thoughts I'm thinking about are quite different to some serious mental health issues. Tonight, I'm going to go in depth a little bit about the brain and how it works. I apologize because it's quite a dense sermon, but please realize that the stuff I'm going to talk about doesn't quite correlate over to depression, anxiety, mental health issues. That is a deeper issue that if you feel like you're struggling with, I'd encourage you to go get professional help. Because that life, that quality of life, I don't think you deserve that. And there is a way out of it. But let me jump back into this. Your negative thoughts. Satiety tells us some different things. We don't deserve it. I get on Instagram all the time. You weren't disciplined enough. You didn't have enough willpower. You're not actually motivated. You only have yourself to blame. And then you start thinking of yourself as a failure. Again, I'm speaking of myself here. This is a time a lot, very often I think of myself. And I expect that most of us have experienced that failure before. We know the feeling of guilt, shame, and it gets us lazy and we turn to sloth. And our brains produce these negative thoughts, and there's a couple of them up here that I thought just from myself that you might have had. You only have yourself to blame. Your ego is a liar. That person who hurt you was in the right. You deserve to feel guilty. You don't belong. And then everyone's waiting for you to leave. Powerful thoughts in your head. This is the battle I'm talking about against these thoughts. It's a common battle. Negative thoughts do not discriminate. Whether your race, your age, your experience, your gender, your wealth or your health or your fame all have this battle of negative thoughts and it's an everyday thing. Everyday thing. So, how do we go about defeating it? I want to start us off with some verses in the Bible and I'm going to read these out for you and I've highlighted the important parts. First one's from Corinthians. We destroy every proud object that keeps people from knowing God and we capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. And then in Romans, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So if you're not a Christian here tonight, I want to debunk the myth that Christianity is just getting a ticket to heaven. That's part of it, and it's amazing. But there's more to Christianity than just that. It also means putting your trust in Jesus Christ. Sometimes we call this like walking out your faith journey or making Jesus your king, or you probably would have heard Jesus take the wheel, you know, take control, I put my trust in you. As my life as a Christian, I don't do that because I want to get to heaven. I do that because I believe that making Jesus king is the pathway to truth, is the pathway to actual rest, to actual peace, purpose, and satisfaction. And really, that's what Dan was saying before, that he couldn't find that peace or purpose anywhere else but in Christ. And man, your story is so amazing. Thank you so much for sharing. Declaring that Jesus is king for him. Now, these verses up here, they tell us that part of putting our faith in God is to actually focus on your thoughts, and in particular, the good ones. It says, so take captive of your rebellious thoughts, teach them to obey God, and to be transformed by the renewal of your minds. These give us a sense that a Christian should actively be renewing their mind from negative thoughts to excellent God-filled thoughts. And in this renewing, we are becoming less like the world around us and more like God. So in a really quick way, the way that we defeat our negative thoughts is to actively reject or make captive our negative thoughts and then we focus on the good thoughts. And somehow that like destroys our negative thoughts. So I've summed it up like this. Reject the negative thoughts and embrace God's goodness. 
reject the negative thoughts and embrace God's goodness. Now these verses, they were written in different texts, different cultures, written about thousands of years ago, but they're still relevant to us today. And they offer us a path forward to, def- to defeat our negative thoughts. But I also want to take a look at modern day science. What does science say about the idea of thoughts? So if you're not a Christian here tonight, man, you're more than welcome. But this is your time to listen in. I'm not going to have any religious jargon in this point here, right? And if you are a Christian, don't stop listening because it's quite interesting. I find neurology very interesting as well. To to take a scientific approach to this question of ours, how do we defeat our negative thoughts, we need to explore the science of what a thought actually is. Like, what is a thought? Can you hold it? Is one thought different from another? How does it work? I got most of my information from what I'm about to share with you from this book. Dr. Caroline Leaf is the author, and she puts it like this. And it's been cut off from the top, I apologise. Your brain is not an input-output machine. You are not an input-output machine. You are not a computer mirroring the world or mirroring the outside world. Here's the kicker. This is what I found in this book. That your brain does not give you an unadulterated, pure reflection of the world around you. Your brain is biased. Last week, Dan brought up this analogy of the jungle, right? And I'm going to quickly reiterate that, but I'm going to add a little bit more detail into it. I want to introduce you to three particular levels or three parts of your brain. And these are not physical parts of your brain, rather they're defined by their function, about what they do in creating a thought. So I'm going to get a bit scientific here, so please stay with me. The first one is this. We call it the non-conscious metacognitive level. Level one. Um, This part of your brain is a jungle. And to create thought is like walking through this dense undergrowth. It costs you energy. This is where about 90 to 99% of the action in your brain occurs. This is the unconscious stuff, like breathing. Like you recognize that this stage, the color is black. You recognize that that is a picture of a jungle, but you're not actively thinking in your mind There's trees there, there's vines, that way it must be a jungle. It's all the stuff happening in the background. There's your non-conscious metacognitive level. Now your brain is very, very good at conserving energy and creates pathways through this jungle. These pathways are created using neurons and our thoughts travel along these neuron paths to the next part of your brain, which is this the conscious cognitive level. Now, if I ask you to picture an elephant, like in your head, picture an elephant, your cognitive conscious level of your mind, that is where that picture is. That's where it's sitting. This accounts for about 10% of your brain activity. It is where that you're aware of your thoughts. So when you're listening to someone and you're having an argument with them, you know how you can listen and kind of build your rebuttal up at the same time? And you're thinking like actively about what I'm going to say next. That is this part of that brain, your level. It's where you're aware of your thoughts, where you build thoughts up. And once you've built that thought, it then goes to the last final part of your brain or the level of your brain, which is the symbolic level. The symbolic level. This is the level that incorporates all of your five senses. Touch, sight, smell, taste, and hearing. These are the ways in which you express those already built thoughts to the world. It also works the other way, where the symbolic level of your brain informs the non-conscious metacognitive level of your mind through your five senses. So the third level actually goes back to the top and you recognize what's going on about you. And these new senses, these new bits of data you've picked up travel through your pathways again, through the jungle and end up in a new space. The most important part for you tonight 
is those pathways in the non-conscious metacognitive level because these pathways are not neutral. These pathways are not neutral. This is where your negative thoughts can come from. You use your five senses to experience the world. You gather up the data of what's happening around you. That data then travels through these pathways and it arrives at your conscious brain level as a negative thought. I kind of picture it like this, where there is a pathway through that part of your brain, but it's a negative one. And the thought you get at the end of that pathway is a negative one. Have, have you ever been in a room and someone walks in and immediately you go, oh, not them again. <laughs> you, don't, you don't try and do that. It just happens, doesn't it? That's what I'm sort of talking about, that negative thought. It ends up coming up out of nowhere. We all have these pathways in our mind. Some are strong, some are really well-travelled pathways. And they will produce negative thoughts automatically. This is called automatonization. That's the word up here. Oh, what is the end doing down there? <laughs> I'm getting some negative thoughts now. <laughs> Your brain will automatically give you a distorted view of what's going on. It'll give you a distorted view of the world and give you a negative thought automatically. This is how negative thoughts occur. But Dr. Caroline Leaf gives you some good news as well. She says that you can actually... You, your brain has the power to create new positive pathways. We can create these new pathways. And the way we do this is by activating the conscious part of your brain, the brain where you build, the part of your brain where you build in that argument, and you think and you focus on positive things. And if you do that enough, that kind of sinks into the background part of your brain becomes a new pathway, and you're automatically getting positive thoughts. Think about when you're riding a bike. You learn how to ride a bike first, and it's difficult. You've got to learn about which leg goes down on the pedals and how to balance, but eventually that cognitive part of your learning sinks into the background, and you can do it without thinking. This is a similar approach. Those positive thoughts will sink into you your metacognitive level of your brain and become automatic. The amount of times... Oh, sorry, let me go back again. For um, Dr. Caroline Leaf, I've summed up what she was saying about how to create these pathways, and she says this. Well, I've said something like this. You've got to reject negative thoughts and embrace positive thoughts. The amount of times you have to actually think about these positive thoughts actually varies between people quite a lot. For some, it is only about 25 times. That means you get a negative thought and you immediately go, no, that's wrong, and you think a positive thought. After 25 times, it becomes automatic. For some, it was recorded to be about 200 times. So it varies quite immensely. But it is possible for you to build these new pathways and to reduce the amount of negative thoughts that you have by rejecting the negative thoughts and embracing the positive thoughts. Or, like our Bible was saying before, reject the negative thoughts and embrace God's goodness. Isn't it strange that the Bible gives us such good advice about neurology <laughs> written thousands of years ago? I actually don't think it's that strange. I think it's fascinating. I think our brains are so complex and detailed, but I believe that that's this way because God actually made it so. He is the reason to why our brains work this way. Like science can explain how your brain works, but God made it so. We can explain that everyone's brain works in a certain way and has these three levels, and we've recorded it, we've measured that stuff, We've seen it's consistent and reliable because that's what science is, right? Science is about recording stuff. It's 
about looking at patterns and trends, what's consistent over time and place. But the Christian will take it a step further and they know why there is consistency. There is consistency in how we are and how the world works because there is a God who is consistent. I've got a verse here from Colossians. The Son, this is Jesus Christ, is the image of an invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. There is consistency in our world because God is holding it together. And he is consistent. See, science explains how something works, but it can never answer the question of why. Science science can tell you how your brain works, but it can't tell you why you exist. Now, if you're exploring Christianity today, and you haven't quite put your faith or your trust in Jesus Christ yet, that's all right. You're on a journey. But there is a reason to why you exist there is one and you do have a purpose you do belong here on earth and that's because God wanted you to exist see these other theories about the origin of humans they use some curious logic to me like I look at evolution for example and if you think that evolution is the answer to why you exist the logical conclusion there is that you are a one in a billion accident and that's it but to even think that in the first place you've got to realize that you've been gifted a working mind to even think you have evolved instead of that answer to why you exist the Christian would believe that they've existed because God chose it and furthermore God tells us what he thinks of us This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It's talking about Christians. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. If you're a Christian here today, you are chosen by God. You are called into this new royal family, And there's inheritance as part of that family. It's called heaven. You belong to that family. You are made holy because of Jesus. This is not me saying this. This is the Bible. You are God's precious possession, his special possession. And you don't have to live in darkness anymore. You can live in God's wonderful, wonderful light. The Bible is full of truths like that. When I say to think about or reject the negative thoughts and embrace God's goodness, this is what I'm thinking. Oh, sorry, we'll go back one. Sorry, Caleb. Instead of thinking, I don't belong here, think, no, God's chosen me. To think that you have no value, think I'm actually God's special possession. And you think that over and over till it sinks to your metacognitive mind. I love that last part too, out of darkness into his wonderful light. I think that's part of our reshaping and renewing our minds, creating these positive pathways. And again, we all have them. What negative pathway do you think is holding you back? What is the negative thought that is holding your mind hostage tonight? could be related to debt, maybe it's an addiction, your health, loneliness, maybe you're looking for meaning or purpose. Your goal for, from me to you tonight is to realize that negative thought and replace it with some of God's focus. Your goal is to repeat a positive God-focused phrase whenever that negative thought comes about. This is the way you renew your mind. This is the way you defeat negative thoughts. I've got a couple of examples here I'll quickly fly through. Maybe you're trying to struggle out, struggle to know what God's will is for you, for your life. 
Instead of thinking that you're lost and you're off the path, I want you to pray. Lord, my life belongs to you. Daily I seek you. And daily you direct my steps. I know your voice and you lead me into this perfect will. Maybe it's lack of confidence. When you start to think that you're not good enough, pray. My confidence is in Christ and Christ alone because His Spirit lives within me and I can do everything that He calls me to do. Maybe you're fighting lustful thoughts. I want you to pray. Lust has nothing to do with me. Christ sacrificed has separated me from that sin as far as the east is from the west. God sees me for me and me alone. Maybe you're battling worry. Pray. Because of Christ, I'm anxious about nothing. I want to stop praying for my day to be bearable. Instead, I pray, God, for a strong faith that I'm walking into a day that you are already in and that you have planned for me. Or perhaps you're feeling lonely or unloved. In that moment, when that negative thought appears, pray. I do not need others validating me. I am so loved already. Christ loved me enough to die for me. He is all I need. The Holy Spirit is with me always. Church, this is how you defeat your negative thoughts. Replace the automation from a negative pathways to positive pathways. Replace it with the truth. Replace it with how Christ already sees you. To finish up, I want to go back to the very start of the Bible in Genesis on a highlight a part that I think is sometimes overlooked. I want us to look back to the Garden of Eden. And if you know the story, you can think back with me. Adam and Eve, they've just eaten the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They realize that they are naked and that they have wronged God. They hide away grab fig leaves in a feeble attempt to cover themselves, to cover their sin and their shame. God calls to them. He then rebukes them in the snake and casts them out of the garden. And then he does this. Then the Lord made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. God kills one of his own animals, creates clothes for Adam and Eve. And think about the experience of Adam and Eve when they wake up the next morning. They wake up in this wilderness, this barren land, where they now have to work for everything they need. Then they only have themselves to blame for getting there. Their negative pathways start filling their heads with these negative thoughts. And then they see the animal skin. And they actively think that God cared enough for them, even after they just wronged him, to clothe them. I imagine that Adam and Eve are realizing every time they put on that clothing, that yes, God is not with them as he once was, but he cares just as much. And they think that every time they put on that garment, it's a reminder that God still cares. They put on this reminder of God's love every day. And in doing that, they are rejecting the negative thoughts and they're embracing God's goodness. For you, this week, find your version of that garment. What is the thing you're going to tell yourself every day to remind you of God's goodness? What is the song you're going to put on every day? What is that thing that you're going to repeat when negative thoughts arise to build those positive pathways in your brain? Because church, it's time to tame your mind. You are no longer hostages of your thoughts anymore. Embrace God's goodness daily and meditate on it. Put on that reminder of God's love. And in doing so, you are going to build these positive pathways and you will defeat negative thoughts. Can I pray for you? Awesome. Lord, we recognize right now that you are good. You are good, Lord. 
Lord, we pray that we can get this recognition of your goodness to sink in to the deeper parts of our brain. Lord, we don't want to be held captive by our thoughts anymore. Lord, we recognize that with you and your story, there is power against this thing. And I pray right now for everyone in this room, would you remind them of your goodness? Tell them, Lord, what is that garment that they're putting on every day to remind themselves of your goodness? And more so, Lord, would you highlight to everyone in this room those negative pathways, those negative thoughts. Bring them out as the lies that they are right now, in Jesus' name. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that. If you did and you want more LifePoint content, subscribe to our channel right now. Or, if you're in the area around Moreton Bay or Rothwell, head to our service. Sunday, we'd love to see you there. LifePoint.org.au for all the details. We'll see you soon.